and I'm the Director of Environment and Health here at Physicians for Social Responsibility. And we are really glad that you can be with us tonight. This is the first in a series of more or less monthly webinars which we'll be doing in which we look at how climate change is harming our health. I'd like to say just a few words about these webinars and what you ex can expect, and then we'll begin. We're going to start off tonight's presentation with Dr. Katherine Thomason, the Executive Director of Physicians for Social Responsibility. Catherine will be presenting an overview of the variety of ways that climate change is affecting health. This is by design a, a quick overview. That's because in our subsequent webinars in the coming months, we're going to take these health effects and look at them one by one in much greater detail, especially in regard to disease mechanisms and harm to health. Now, as uh, for those of you who've been waiting patiently um, over the past minute or two, you've got a quick preview uh, that we're going to begin tonight's presentation with a short pop quiz. If uh, you're not too fond of pop quizzes or it's been a long time since you were in school, don't panic. You'll learn all the answers in tonight's webinar. After Catherine completes her presentation and reviews the answers to the quiz, I'm going to talk to you a little bit, a little bit about an advocacy action that we encourage all of you to take. Now, in our webinars, we'll look at one advocacy action or skill in each webinar so that in addition to learning about climate change and health, you'll practice a skill that will help you use that information to bring about changes in US policy. You'll actually help reduce climate change and protect the health and the lives of your loved ones and of all of us. We're going to start tonight with an easy adv advocacy action, writing a letter to the editor. I'll give you some hands-on advice about letter writing, and then it'll be your turn. We're going to look at a sample letter to the editor, and applying what you have learned, you're going to tell me how that letter could be made stronger and more effective. We're thinking that each of these segments will last about 15 minutes. It's our goal to complete this webinar by 8.30 Eastern time. Uh, let's see how it goes. And Catherine, would you take it away? Good evening. It's delightful to uh, have so many folks um, online. Um, this particular presentation, um, again, is an overview of extreme weather impacts on public health. And it will be available uh, for any of you to use in your own presentations in your community. Um, I would probably not use this by itself if I were doing a presentation because it's so dreadful to just hear about the bad things uh, that I would probably follow it up with um, some of the solutions and hope that we can have if we take action in the future. Um, and a more complete presentation is online on our website. So let's go ahead with the pre-quiz. Um, as some of you who hopped on right on time, um, these questions will all be answered throughout the presentation. So the first is, which extreme weather event is responsible for the greatest number of deaths in the United States? The second is, name three dangerous insect-borne diseases that are expanding their ranges due to increase in temperatures. Thirdly, how much will world grain production drop if the average temperature rises by 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit? Many people have studied and read about the heat wave in 2003 in Europe. How many people were killed? And lastly, over the past 35 years, the number and proportion of hurricanes reaching categories 4 and 5 have either doubled, tripled, or quadrupled. So increases in extreme weather events are already impacting our health. Nine of the ten hottest years on record have occurred in the past 12 years. Just in recent months, extreme rainfall and floods have affected us everywhere, from the Mississippi Valley to Australia. Superstorm Sandy has devastated human lives and led to tens of billions of dollars in damage. The most severe drought in decades spread over half the United States last summer and shows signs of persisting this year. Climate change is already happening and it's entered our daily lives. With that in mind, I want to remind ourselves, what do we need to have good health? 
And how might that be impacted by climate change? Of course, first, we need adequate, nutritious food. We also need safe, affordable housing. We absolutely have to have clean air. And likewise, we need clean, safe drinking water. We, we in this country and in most third, first world countries are totally reliant on electricity for preservation of our food, for our air conditioning on a day like today here in DC, for elevators, for our medicine storage, and many other essentials in modern life. Lastly, we rely on the government to provide us with public health services to protect us from infectious disease and to help support us in case of catastrophe. Extreme weather events will affect each and every one of these absolutely essential needs for clean air, water, housing, food, and infrastructure. So the most obvious extreme weather event that will happen with climate change is heat waves. The leading killer of extreme weather in this country is heat waves. Heat that is long-lasting, occurring with higher humidity, especially when the temperature doesn't go down at night, such as in cities due to heat urban island effect, are the most devastating. Heat waves are worse for people who don't have air conditioning and those who are most vulnerable, such as the elderly, the young, and those who are chronically ill. There will likely be many more deaths in third world countries from heat waves due to more vulnerable populations and no air conditioning. But in those countries, it is hard to estimate numbers of deaths. The best documented epidemiologic study in first world countries showed an excess of 70,000 deaths. Not just from heat stroke, but also from heart attack, lung disease, and other causes that were exacerbated by heat. Ozone pollution is part of the secondary cause of death during, found during heat waves. If ozone is currently the most pervasive air pollutant in the United States, and millions of Americans live in areas that fail to meet the national ozone health standard. The United States Environmental Protection Agency estimates that in warming of 2 degrees centigrade would increase ozone concentration by 5% in much of the nation. Ozone exposure can have a range of adverse health effects. It's kind of like having sunburn in your lungs. It can reduce lung function and even lung volume in children who are growing up in areas of high ozone. Ozone is known to affect the cardiovascular system and exacerbate chronic lung diseases. It can increase the risk of arrhythmias and heart attack as well. Lastly, it's known to increase low birth weight. And in the first and third trimester, it can cause tw a 20% intrauterine growth retardation. This Lancet article revealed the relative risk of developing asthma in children playing three or more sports during a year in areas in which they had within which they were exposed to high ozone concentrations. This risk was not seen in children playing three or more sports in areas of low ozone. Rising temperatures and changing weather patterns will also have a number of secondary impacts that could jeopardize human well-being in regions across the globe. The spread of infectious diseases is one example of such secondary impacts. Mosquitoes, which can carry malaria or dengue fever, or ticks that can carry West Nile virus and or other diseases are highly sen sensitive to temperature changes. Higher temperatures boost their reproductive and biting rates, lengthen their breeding season, and shorten the time it takes for the malarial pathogen to mature to an infectious state. Increasing temperatures may also, and are currently shown to to be expanding the viable range of mosquitoes that carry these, these illnesses to higher elevations in more northern latitudes, putting at risk previously unexposed populations. Along with rising temperatures, changes in precipitation can also lead to the spread of malaria, with floods potentially triggering outbreaks as they leave behind vector breeding sites. 
Each year, approximately 500 million people are infected with malaria, of which 1 million will die. As global warming continues, some estimates predict as many as 90 to 200 million additional people will be at risk of malaria just by 2050. Now, I really love this slide. You know, it's a map put out by the CDC in 2005, and it's just wonderful that dengue fever doesn't cross the border into the United States. But unfortunately, that's probably not the case. 30% of Brownsville, Texas residents are positive for um, antibodies for dengue fever. This map shows the expanding range of dengue fever within the United States. Another extreme weather event is drought. Drought stresses our forests and challenges our agriculture. Two million acres of pinyon forest in the southwest have been decimated by the tiny bark beetle that wouldn't have been as much of a problem with a healthy stand of trees. But those which are affected by drought are more likely to be infected. Worldwide, a third of the population, or two billion people, currently live in water-stressed countries. By 2100, up to nearly a third of the world's land surface may be at risk of extreme drought by 2100. Rising temperatures will also change agricultural practices all around the world. For example, grapes, orchards, and certain crops like potatoes can be quite temperature sensitive. The most devastating effects will occur in countries that can't afford different types of seed stocks for changes in temperature especially for staple crops like wheat or corn. Estimates vary, but for every 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit increase in global average surface temperature, we can expect about a 10% decline in yields of the world's major grain crops, corn, soybean, rice, and wheat. Climate experts predict that global temperatures may rise as much as 5 to 9 degrees Fahrenheit. And if we continue to that is, if we continue to burn fossil fuels at our current rate, this could lead to a 30 to 50 percent decline in crop production. The opposite of drought, of course, are floods or increase in, in severe weather with rain. More severe hurricanes and other causes of storms will increase flooding. As global temperatures rise, the global water cycle is accelerated and the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere increases. The result is more intense downpours, even when the total precipitation may remain the same. Flooding causes numerous effects. First, in the short term, it causes injuries and death, half of which in this country are attempts to drive through flooded areas. It also affects infrastructure, such as homes, businesses, subways, water treatment, you name it. It can cause increases in mold, which is a major health issue, causing asthma exacerbation or lung disease. It also, of course, causes long-term psychological effects from the loss of home, the loss of personal property and family effects, and it can contaminate water supplies. Hurricanes, too, are expected to increase in intensity and duration as ocean temperatures rise, which build the strength of a hurricane. In the last 35 years, it's estimated that the severity and intensity of hurricanes have doubled. Looking at the social determinants of health after a disaster is also extremely important. The example of the horrible storm Katrina, um, the slide looks at the pre- and post-Katrina um, determinants. Before Katrina, less than 25% of New Orleans was below the poverty level, and 20% were uninsured. Three years after, over 50% within New Orleans itself were unemployed and on Medicaid. There were seven hospitals present and open for business in New Orleans before Katrina hit. And two years later, only one was fully functional and two partially. As of 2010, there were five hospitals open. 
and no further hospital were planned. So basically what I want to leave you with is that extreme weather is already happening. It's seriously impacting our health. Climate change will impact our health by air pollution, causing heat waves, fouling the water with floods, tearing apart homes, hospitals, and the electrical system, and causing spreading vector-borne diseases, let alone hundreds of billions of dollars in damages. Climate change is happening, and it has entered our daily lives. So I'd like to go through those questions, um, which I'm sure you all now know or you may have known at the beginning. Um, the first one was, which extreme weather event is responsible for the greatest number of deaths in the United States? And that answer is heat waves. Three dangerous insect-borne diseases among others, that are expanding their ranges due to global warming include malaria, dengue, and West Nile virus. How much will world grain production drop with average temperatures rise by 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit? The answer is 10%. The number of people killed in the European heat wave of 2003 was 70,000. And lastly, the US EPA estimates that warming of 2 degrees centigrade will increase ozone concentration by 5%. So again, I encourage um, people to take this webinar, or this presentation, which will be available on our website and email to you, um, to use in your own communities, and perhaps add some actions that one can take uh, which we can talk about now, or if we have time, um, to answer some questions. Barb? Okay, thank you very much, Catherine. That's quite an overview of the powerful health effects that extreme weather caused by climate change is already imposing on us and our neighbors. What we're going to do now is to get some quick pointers on how to write a letter to the editor that delivers a clear, strong message about climate change and health. <clears throat> okay. Just one moment, please. Okay. So, first of all, um, we want to ask the what we hope is a fairly obvious question, why would you write a letter to the editor? Well, it's a great way to influence your community and your legislators. The letters page of a newspaper is among the most widely read pages. Your neighbors read the letters page, and it can influence their thinking about whether or not climate change is real. It can deepen their understanding of climate change as a health issue. It can also help move them to take action. Importantly, let us, legislators also read the letters page, so it's a good way to let them know where you stand on an important issue like climate change. It's also free and it's easy, but we'll get to that in a minute. Another value of writing letters to the, in, to the newspaper is that they influence the newspaper even when the letters are not printed. If you've ever written a letter to the editor, you've probably had the experience of not getting printed. And, you know, it's kind of disappointing, but as disappointing as it is, don't think that your letter had no effect. Editors take note of how many letters they receive on a given topic. It's kind of like uh, sending an action alert to a legislator. A large volume of letters can help determine what topics they're going to respond to, or in the case of newspapers, what they're going to cover and how much. Now, I'd like to say that writing a letter to the editor is as easy as A, B, C, and 1, 2, 3. OK, so maybe it's not that easy, and maybe I'm being a little bit corny, but I want to uh, present some basic advice in ways that I hope that you will remember. So A, B, and C refer to what your letter's about, be brief, and be concise. We'll take those one at a time. When you write a letter to the editor, you want to write about something that's in the newspaper. 
You don't pick just any topic. If you want to get your letter printed, you take as your starting point a recent item that was in that paper. And it makes a lot of sense if you think about it from the newspaper's business plan perspective. One of the things the newspaper uses the letter page to do is to generate free content. Well, that's nice for them. It also serves them by demonstrating reader engagement and brand loyalty. So they're looking to you to keep the conversation going by responding to something that they already published. Bearing that in mind, your best chance of being printed is to respond to an editorial, an op-ed, or a front page story. And when you do respond to an article, you want to cite the specific article's name, date, and or author. All these things will help you show the paper that you're doing what they want. Be brief. Most newspapers have a policy limiting the length of letters. It's typically about 200 to 250 words. That's not much. But you really, because of that, you want to keep to that limit or be even briefer. The policy for your newspaper should be posted either on the letters page or uh, elsewhere on the newspaper's website. C is concise. And it sounds like being brief, but it means a little bit more. It means you're not writing an essay. You can't present all the evidence. You can't make the complete case. You keep it short and simple. The best advice, make one point, illustrate it with one fact. This is, uh, this is hard, I know, for some of us. I think it's hard for a lot of doctors who are really interested in having a full understanding and scientific documentation. But if you're finding that you have to give a lot of background information, if you're finding that you're really tempted to write a lot of facts, well, take care. You may actually be writing an op-ed article, not a letter to the editor. Op-ed articles can be a lesson for another day. But for a letter, you want to make sure that your main point is clear. And you, as a test, ask yourself, can your reader quickly and easily summarize your main takeaway point? So that's ABC. One, two, three is uh, some simple advice about how to construct your argument. One is state the issue. One thing you could do is simply refer to the issue as it was reported in the newspaper and then say why you agree or why you disagree. Or you can just state the issue as you understand it. You know, you can say climate change is happening, it's happening now, and it's harming our community. Or, uh, you know, climate change is not about polar bears anymore, it's about our health. Number two, you want to build your case. And here you do give a little bit more depth, a little bit more detail. In addition, I think it's very important for you to come in as a person. You want to weigh in using your own voice. Now, if you're a health professional or if you're simply a, me a member of Physicians for Social Responsibility, you have a real advantage and I would encourage you to use it. Your position as a health professional or your position as a PSR member helps to convey authority. So if you can say in your letter, I'm a doctor, I'm a nurse. In my 14 years of nursing experience, I have observed, you know, dot, dot, dot. Uh, or if simply your health is affected by climate change or someone that you love is, say that. If you're proposing renewable energy and you have solar panels on your roof, say that too. So be sure that your voice and your experience shine through. And while you do have to stick to the facts, don't be afraid to let your feelings be known. If you, like me, are terrified by climate change, if you're worried sick for your patients or for your kids or for your grandchildren, say so. You know, people won't remember the facts, but they will remember and they'll be able to tell when you speak from your heart. Now, we're PSR. We're in, in this uh, business because we want people to take action that will lead to real change for the world. So if you can, in your letter, tell the reader what they can do. Be specific. Be concrete. You can suggest a collective action or a policy action that is big enough to actually reduce climate change. That could be working for a piece of legislation. It could be supporting the closure of a local coal-fired power plant. It could be supporting the transition to clean, healthy, low-carbon energy. You can't make the complete case, but you can tell them which way we need to move. If you're calling on a legislator to take action, or if you're calling on a corporation to clean up its act, include their full name. And then, after you send your letter, send a copy of the letter to the legislator or the corporation. This will help double your impact. 
So that's one, two, three. I'm just going to follow that up with a few very brief um, kind of common sense uh, additional points. We're talking about the news business. Yesterday's news is old news. Submit your letters by email. Local connections sell newspapers. Newspapers love them. Readers want them. So if you live or if you work or if you study in the newspaper's home area, let that be known. Hopefully you can talk about climate health impacts in your local area. Again, if you're um, talking about politicians, mention a local politician by name. And then a few more details. You sign your letter with your full name. If you are a health professional, please do include your, mental, your, your medical credentials. The newspaper will probably also ask you to provide your home address, your email address, and your phone. These are for ver verification purposes. They will not be published. The newspaper will probably want to contact you and just verify that you did, in fact, write the letter. And then finally, if you have any personal or financial interest in the subject matter, you want to, of course, own up to that. Your um, letter is subject to editing by the newspaper for length, for clarity, or for style. A lot of people have had their letters edited, and they haven't been very happy with the result. So you want to avoid that unhappiness. One way of doing that is keep your letter short. Also, most newspapers will print a letter from the same person only every so often. Uh, this is likely to be about once every 60 days. It could be less frequently in um, the large high circulation newspapers. So if your intention is to be published, you know, don't, don't submit more frequently. But remember what I said earlier, if you're just trying to, if you're trying to demonstrate reader interest in the subject, you can submit more frequently. And I think that's especially worthwhile if you're part of an organized effort to sway editorial coverage. Finally, your submission must be unique. When the newspaper runs something, it's part of their product, they want to know you haven't submitted it or published it in any other media. Please don't do that. OK, now it's your turn. What we're going to do now is to ask you to apply what you've learned by critiquing a letter that somebody else wrote. Remember, this is what we've looked at. Uh, ABC was about writing about something that's now in the news, being brief, making your case concisely, stating the issue in your own words, building your case with your perspective and your identity, and including a call to action. So if you're ready, I'm going to read you the letter. Then we're going to go through it and critique it paragraph by paragraph. So here comes the letter. Ah, uh, let's see, just a minute. Of course, I can't. <laughs> I can't read you the letter if uh, I've got my uh, control panel on. Let's see if I can do this. The article after the Devast devastation: A Daunting Recovery by James Barron describes the chaos and devastation in New York in the wake of Hurricane Sandy. Scientific consensus holds that hurricanes will become more frequent and more intense as air and sea level temperatures continue to rise. Areas like New York City are extremely vulnerable to natural disasters due to their dense po population and close, close proximity to the Atlantic. For these reasons, hurricane mitigation should be high on New York's priority list in order to protect the safety of its people. As a health professional, I cannot ignore the impacts that Hurricane Sandy has had on public health. In addition to the threat of drowning or inju in injury from windblown debris that can occur during a hurricane, health risks in the aftermath of the storm must be considered as well. Healthcare infrastructure may be destroyed, like the electricity in New York City hospitals. Refills of medication prescriptions may be unacceptable. Floodwaters carrying toxic chemicals or raw sewage can contaminate water supplies, increasing the risk of disease transmission. Floodwaters often create mold, which can lead to allergic illness and respiratory infection. The mental health of hurricane survivors is also affected. Some suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, while others suffer from grief and anxiety. Adequate preparation can reduce these impacts. For those living in New York City or along coastlines, hurricane preparation is critical for public health and survival. Mitigation is necessary, too. Climate change is a problem too big for us to cure, so prevention is our only hope. OK, so that's the letter. Here's the first paragraph. 
what I'd like to know is, what do you think about this? Okay, here's, do you like it? This is the opening of the letter. Is it clear? Is it strong? Does it get to its point soon enough? Is there anything you would change? Tell me if you would change anything here. And the way you do that, to share your comments, look on your little control panel, and there's a raise your hand button. It's got a blue circle and then a red hand with a green arrow over it. I mean, to me, actually, the hand looks kind of like flames. So if people will um, press that button and, quote, quote, raise your hand, I'll call on you and unmute your phone, and then you can go ahead and share your perspective. And um, Julia, I may require your help. Let's see. Do we have anybody raising their hand to uh, critique this letter? OK, well, we don't have any hands up. So I wonder whether that means you guys really like this paragraph? I had my hand up. Well, thank you. Uh, if you'll, um, <laughs> I'm sorry for whatever reason it's not showing on my screen. Thank you for jumping in. Um, you want to go ahead and tell us your thought or your comment? Well, on, on first reading, it's, it is uh, concise. It does refer to, tells you what it's about, et cetera, et cetera. And it's leading you to think the next paragraph is going to be about hurricane mitigation. Is that good or is that bad? Do you like it? There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. It's just that I know the next paragraph is practically a lecture on all the health implications of climate change. Okay. Well, why don't we go on to that well, next chapter? Next. Actually, paragraph. Richard, um, Barb, Richard Denton has his um, hand up, and I've unmuted him. Uh, basically, saying the same thing. Uh, it, it just maybe needs to be a little more concise. Okay. Anybody else? And uh, Julia, will you please unmute people because it's, it's not showing up on my screen at all. Do we have anybody else? Not right now. OK, thank you. So what we're hearing is that the, the information is good, the information is uh, to the point, but it's uh, perhaps a little bit too verbose. We'll uh, go on to the second paragraph. Here's paragraph two. Um, once again, we've <clears throat> it's the paragraph that I read to you. Uh, you can take a minute to look at it. And then if you will um, raise your hand with a little sign, and Julia or um, Catherine, you can, if you would be so kind as to um, call on somebody and unmute them when you do. Uh, Jeff Patterson? Unmute. Well, uh, it says as a health professional, which is good. You're identifying yourself as a health professional. Uh, but then it talks about the impacts that Hurricane Sandy has had on public health, but doesn't really uh, du directly relate that to that issue. It goes on to talk about general impacts that hurricanes can have on public health, but not what happened with Sir Hurricane Sandy. So I think there's some confusion about um, what what you want to state here. That's great. Thank you, Jeff. Anybody else? OK, so what I heard was that there's the person did kind of begin to assert their, um, their identity as a health professional, but they didn't really build on that in terms of their experience. We don't know if they were in New York. And in fact, they didn't really talk about what happened in New York in a very specific way. It became uh, much more general. And okay. Richard Denton has his uh, hand up. Just a question. Uh, th this person's obviously listed many uh, uh, effects of the hurricane. I is it uh, ever good to number them or not? I, I think from what you've said, said number one, you, you only have one. Uh, um, situation or what one uh, focus on, on, on one uh, issue, but uh, what about the use of numbering? Is that uh, a good idea or not? 
Well, uh, do you mean like the first concern I have, the second and the third, or might you also Correct. be referring to, um, you know, I think that's a stylistic choice that you can make for yourself. If, if uh, I mean, this is kind of a long paragraph, uh, and so if numbering would help people to keep track, that would be useful. However, since these, um, since there's rather a long series of individual examples, you could be chalking up quite a long list of numbers, and at that point, I think people's eyes glaze over. Another possible use of numbers is to talk about, is to quantify these impacts. So in, in the case of New York, do we know how many people were affected, how many hospitals lost their electricity, how many people didn't have access to their medication, were there or were there not um, increased, uh, an increase in the incidence of waterborne diseases? So that's a different kind of use of numbers, and although I would use it sparingly, as I would generally use numbers sparingly, they can help give greater weight. The information is more authoritative because it's more precise. Um, I also just wanted to note that uh, one of the listeners, Regna, has um, made a comment saying, isn't this entire LTE more suited to an op-ed submission? <laughs> well, um, I think I think that's a, that's a fair criticism. It's um, it's a little on the long side. It's um, not short and punchy. We did a word count on this, and it was um, within the 250 word limit. But it's I, I just think it's worth all of us reflecting on the fact that one of us reading this letter thought thought to themselves, this is really pushing it. And so. Um, especially for someone who is writing with some expertise and knows a lot about the subject, there's, there often is that, that desire, you know, to share what you know and to make the case very strongly, but frequently less is more. Let's move on now to the final paragraph. Now, this one is much shorter. Is, um, is, this, a, is this a good, this is the close of your argument. Does it close with a strong punch? You know, is, this, is it memorable? Is it clear? Do we have anybody who would like to raise their hands? Ah. Susanna Fox, are you raising your hand? No. OK, Julia and Catherine, if you can help me out once again. Yeah, I'm not seeing any. Uh, Jeff Patterson has a comment. Jeff, can you go ahead? Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, well, I think it confuses the issues here. Uh, it talks about hurricane preparation uh, being critical, which is really what mitigation is, um, you know, whether it's building dikes or whether it's preparing your home or whatever. Uh, and then uh, the last uh, sentence is prevention is our only hope, but it really doesn't build on that. Uh, I'm not sure that this is a very clear final statement, frankly. Um, at the risk of putting you on the spot, would you um, like to suggest how you might reword at least one of those sentences? Uh, well, I probably would just take out mitigation is necessary, too. Um, and um, because that the first two sentences are really about preparation and mitigation. And then I might add. I might redo the last part and uh, just say something like, uh, in addition, it is uh, important for us to work on uh, the causes of climate change to prevent this problem in the first place, something like that. And okay. Connie, had a, Connie had a comment as well, um, given the fact that so many examples were given of the impacts that there were no examples of preparation or prevention provided. And Richard Denton also had a comment. Go ahead, Richard. No, same, same comment. Uh, no, no specifics to um, how to do the, the mitigation. OK. Do we have any more comments on this? Uh, John, go ahead. John, you're unmuted. Well, I wonder if we have we lost John there. 
Let's take time for um, for one more comment, if there are any more. Okay, well, that's okay. I think we've done a pretty thorough job um, putting this, this uh, letter through the ringer. Um, but I think it's been very helpful. We have found as the kind of the general um, advice was, you really do want to keep it short. You want to have examples, but maybe not too many examples. You want your examples to be concrete. And I think one of the things that came out in, in looking at this final paragraph was that um, to give examples in one part of your letter and then not to give similar um, weight to your conclusion can actually um, weaken your conclusion. OK, well, this has been really great. Thank you very much. And thanks to all of our web participants who spoke up. Um, you know, the, the next step now is going to be um, up to you. We really want you to go forth and write LTEs. What we'd like to see is all of you trying your hand at writing and submitting a letter to the editor in the next two weeks talking about climate change and health. Um, so we um, wanted to ask, you know, again, we started out by saying A, B, C, A is about what's in the news. What do you think you're going to find in your newspaper that you can respond to? Is there anybody, before we do the poll, let's just um, see if anybody wants to, again, electronically raise your hand and see if there's anything that's in the news where you live, that's happening where you live and likely to be in the newspaper in the next day or week that has um, that gives you a hook, that gives you a talking point um, that you think the newspaper will pick up on that's related to climate change, extreme weather, and health. We have any takers go, there? Bar. Go, go ahead, Maureen. Yeah. Uh, well, of course, those of us here in Iowa, and I don't know about you, Jeff, in Wisconsin, but we're likely now going through the third 500-year flood in the last uh, two decades. Okay. Um, so, of course, there's lots to write about. What I would want to know is when not to tell the truth or when to be a little subtle about it. You know, it's like, you know, after somebody dies, you don't refer to them being a wife beater. Um, but uh, the university lost a lot of buildings, and the university was in, you know, for many millions of dollars with the last flood in 2008. And uh, today we're we're lo we're going into lockdown again. Um, huge sandbagging efforts going on as as the rivers uh, marching up uh, through town. And she sends out a letter, the president, about how they're really well prepared, they're really doing everything they can, you know, bear with them, this, that, and the other, all the lessons they learned. And meanwhile, um, in the last five years, we've been trying to get the university to come off of coal, to divest from the uh, major uh, petroleum fossil fuel companies, you know, out of, out of our portfolio of investment for the university. Do you suppose that it would just be utterly rude and awful at this point in time to kind of remind them that there's more to do besides sandbagging? Or would you suggest that would be the sort of letter you would write once the river goes back down? I, I think this question of timing is really key. I, I, um, as the river's rising, as losses are taking place, as people's health and possibly their lives are being endangered, might not be the time to um, sound that note. But I think you're exactly right. As the waters are subsiding and before they're gone, while the costs are all before people's eyes, I, I think that sounds like a very good time, Maureen, to say, you know, if we're really serious about not going through this again and again and again, we have to take the kinds of actions that address the causes of climate change and not just put the sandbags in place. Um, Jeff had a comment about a uh, huge storm in Wisconsin. And uh, John Rocco also had a comment. John, you're unmuted from our side. <laughs> Technical glitches. Shall we try with Jeff, if Jeff had a comment about a storm? Go ahead. 
we yeah, we have a tornado watch here, and so we're just kind of watching what's happening. Uh, so, <laughs> um, I just to, we may need you to go down the basement. <laughs> in terms of tornadoes, um, there has not been a statistical um, correlation with climate change. Um, so, being careful, um, as you may have noticed, we didn't comment that the number of hurricanes has increased, but rather when hurricanes occur, they are more intense uh, and last longer. Um, so being cautious in what we link to, I think, is very worthwhile. But in intensity of storms, the amount of rain, um, the derecho that occurred, um, those kinds of things might be, are definitely more correlated with climate change. Okay, well, I mean, you know, we're hearing it. We're hearing storms, and we're hearing flooding. We're hearing repeat flooding. We're hearing, you know, 100-year floods, 500-year floods coming year after year after year. By the way, we're here in Washington, D.C. Um, summer unofficially started today. It's in the 90s. It's hot. It's also a code orange day for ozone. And as Catherine was saying earlier, um, it's that excess heat that is causing the volatile organic compounds, compounds from car exhaust and other sources to combine with other chemicals and form ground level ozone, endangering our lungs and possibly causing permanent lung damage. So you can expect to see all these kinds of stories in, in your newspaper, depending on where you are, you know, whether it's dr uh, droughts or floods, fires or heat. I'm afraid it's all coming our way. We have to worry about whether or not the X, uh, Keystone XL pipeline is coming our way. We've got the coal-fired power plants. We've also got, you know, the possibilities for, for solar power and wind and geothermal and the, the kind of hopeful messages. All of these things are our opportunities to respond to what we see, respond to what's in the news, and write that effective letter to the editor. So as our last question to you, as we said, we'd like all of you to try and write your hand and send a letter to the editor in the next two weeks. Um, if you're willing to try, you'll see that there's something on your screen now that says poll open. If you can click on the little plus sign where it says poll, and then you can vote and tell us, are you willing to try to um, write this letter to the editor? So while you guys go ahead and try, I'll just give you one more plug. I hope you will give it a try. Again, there's, there's no harm in trying. You'll just get better with practice. Remember the ABC and the 1, 2, 3 to get you started? That's just to get you started. You then write your own letter, write from your experience, write from your expertise, and write from your heart. Give you another minute on this. OK, we had another vote. We brought it up to 57% yes, 60% yes, 63% yes. Let's get one more vote, and let's get 2 thirds of, of our people willing to take this chance. We're at 65%. I want one more person to say, yes, I will. I will go to my newspaper. I will see what their word limit is, where and how to submit my letter. And in the next week or two, I will send a letter about my concern about climate change as a health issue. A lot of people are still thinking of it as an environmental issue, but more and more we're understanding what the, um, the health effect is. So this is great. This is really, we're at, we're at 65%. I think that's just fine. It's, um, thank you so much. You know, there, we, there are a number of us here in the office in our extended uh, work day here in the office here in Washington, D.C. You guys are all taking time away from your families or from your work or from your personal life. Your willingness to take these next steps really makes this time entirely worthwhile. So I thank you very much. And of course, if you do get your letter, letter published, don't forget to send us a copy or a link. What we're going to do tomorrow is to send you a link to uh, this the um, PowerPoint presentation that Catherine made. And also, as she said, we'll also send you a link to the longer version that includes slides about the positive solutions that are available to us through pursuit of safe, clean, low-carbon energy. There still is time for us to save our world. But if we're going to do that, we need to take action and make that happen. So I'll send you link, links to both versions. Take these PowerPoints and go out and speak to your communities. The information on writing letters to the editor will also come to you as a Word document. Finally, I just have to say, don't forget to join us in one month for our next webinar. It will be about heat waves, the big killer in climate change, at least in this country. 
The date for that, that is Wednesday, June 26th at 7.30 Eastern Time, 4.30 Pacific Time. Put it in your calendars now. We'll talk to you then, and everybody, have a good night. Thank you.